fear that we fear that they have something out that the majority of the people don't know about. They will run to the house, let them have to let it give you a flash. Now I'll show you for it. Now for them, they are pent up feelings that, that may result from decades of repression and people who've had members of their family killed by that regime. A lot of killers, get a lot of killers. Why well, you think our country's so innocent? But I won't attack it because someone fixed me up. I don't let anybody use me to fight their battles. Hello and welcome to Barn Blog. And today is another solo short. I'm going to respond to some things that happened in uh, this is Revolution video that I did. It was very popular. Uh, both channels streamed very well. Um, and it was called "What's Next for the World Economy," and it's a three-hour discussion. Um, and about two hours in, I mentioned the problem with over-investing in particular figures. And I mentioned the debates between Sam Cedar and uh, Jimmy Dore, which led to a lot of people defending Sam Cedar, some people defending Dore. Both sides were very upset with what I said. This has also been the largest thing commented on uh, on my... Uh, on my comments so far even though it's the least absolute least important thing i talked about and what i was saying and i think two people do did get this so this is not it's not that sam cedar is a bad guy and jimmy Dore is a good guy and in fact i would talk for a variety of reasons from the way parasocial relationships to are used to how broad uh people that cedar platforms versus how narrow people that door platforms are, you can tell a lot of things by who the people have on and who they don't, all right? It's not that having someone who has views that you disagree with on, on a show is bad. In fact, you should. Um, you should never just seek out information sources that are totally copacetic with your prior beliefs. The issue is when you start seeing a selectivity bias and someone's claiming to just ask to just ask the questions, but they're only asking the questions for one side in a non-hostile manner. Okay, fine. So that's the issue with Door, and I mentioned the his pushback on the mandates, and there was legitimate grievances about the mandates, but I also pointed out who he had platformed and how he had platformed them. But beyond that. All right, that's not, and I know people are going to get caught up in this again because what I'm actually focused in on is the fact that in a three hour video, mostly about the history of the left and the problems of geopolitics, people focused in solely on which media figures they identified with. And that is by far the most commented element of what I said. And it leads me to the parasociality problem. And I don't think the parasociality problem is a personal failing or um, a it makes you a bad person that you have parasocial relationships. Parasociality is not all negative. It's not avoidable. Um, and then I'm going to talk also about the united front versus popular front and the difference between the two. And why it matters. All right. And I'm going to talk about sectarian logic and why, in times where things feel like they failed, it's a natural response to a failed popular front or a failed populist movement. And it's not just something unique to the left, it is not unique to left psychology. That's not what I'm saying at all. So the reason why people get so attached, I think, to parasocial figures and media figures is because they don't have levers in which to affect policy. And a lot of these levers are pseudo levers. So, for example, promoting AOC or the squad, whatever the problems, seem like a way for you to affect policy in the United States. However, 
If you look at the actual voting records with the progressives in Congress, you don't affect policy with the voting records in the United States by doing that because they don't strategically have a way to really hold the Democrats accountable, uh, the, 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 the centrist Democrats accountable, and eventually they need the centrist too much to continue getting anything done for them to actually operate. Now, one of the things that has changed about this is during the late aught teens and with the introduction of, of Twitter into the political discourse, Twitter being actually one of the smallest platforms and brands, it is a discourse for people who do discourse. It is where media people go because its algorithm is not as hindered and is not as pay to play as Facebook and other massive social media aggregators. So what so that gives Twitter a disproportionate effect on the discourse. And you have people from very small districts, a few thousand people, who who now act as national level politicians, even though they do not have a national level constituency. You saw that with AOC. She's not the only one. You you've seen this develop on the right too, and Trump was really the prototype for it. The difference is Trump was a celebrity first. This parasociality is easily abused. All right. One of the things I'm going to give credit for to Sam Cedar for for my criticism of him, and I'm going to talk about the problems. I get a lot of people saying, "Well, Sam criticizes the the uh, the Democratic Party all the time." Yes, he does. You know, so does Bashkas and Kara. So does you know a lot of these people. But I'm going to come back to that in a minute, and really want you to sit with what I'm saying here. You know how I said in a previous video, and you should go back and watch it if you haven't, um, that you get what you ask for, not what you say you ask for. Real criticizing the Democrats and never being willing to let any of them lose not just to a progressive, but to even a Republican, means that your criticism has no teeth. Popular front logic has always encouraged you to vote blue no matter who are any number of things, right? You have to maintain the coalition because the fascists or the capitalists, to insult the, the, insert the person here, means that the old ways of doing coalitionary building on the on the far left on the marxist left is not viable now what were the old ways well the traditional united front strategy um coming out of the second international and maintained during the common term period until 1928 is that in parliamentary republics you would not form a coalition government with liberal bourgeois policies but you would vote with them to block regressive policies if you were in office. What you didn't want to be stuck doing was being seen managing a failing capitalist state run by a liberal bourgeois par party or having to manage the, the scenario. This is exactly what, what the SP Day dropped in the 1920s leading up to the fascist catastrophe. The first response to this from the Soviets was the encouragement of the United Front from below, and only the United Front from below. So you could go for the rank-and-file members who were not in your party, as long as they were workers, but no one else. This was actually the strategy used by early organizers, many of whom came out of the IWW to the TUUL. In America... Um, but it also led to the, the kind of unforgivable violence between both sides between the k uh the k the kapd and the kpd the communist party of, of of germany and the social democrats the inability for them to ever have to taunt with each other and the third period people saying the third period of communist parties actually saying that working with fascists was actually preferable to working with social democrats, but one shouldn't work with fascists either. 
All right, that was the third period stance. I can go into the specifics of this, but but that's what happened in in Europe. In America, third periodism actually meant that there was no attempt to enter either the Republican or Democratic Party. Priorly, the 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 left wing movement had been represented by first the populist and socialist parties, then um, the communist parties after the socialist parties kind of fell and the populist parties lost steam and certain parts of them de degenerated in conspiracy theories, certain popular, certain parts of them in the South got attached into people like Huey Long and when Huey Long was assassinated, lost steam. There's a bunch of reasons why the populace failed. But the main point you need to take away from that is that led to a shift into the communist parties. Still a fairly mass party, bigger than bigger in proportion to the to the size of the population than the DSA is now. They maintained a hostile stance towards the Democrats, particularly in the South, for reasons that are obvious, because the South, the Southern Democrats were overseeing a regressive Jim Crow state's early beginnings. So no concession was seen to be made, and it led for independent organizing, both within the syndicalist and within the communist um, union movements. And you saw some of the biggest gains in, in the beginnings of the union movement. During the New Deal, for reasons that are as much geopolitical as strategic, there was a deliberate effort to become key figures in in the CIO. Um, CIO was not run by communists. It was run by John Lewis, who was a Republican. Um, but it became where the communists organized against the AFL, which who often pushed for guild shops, protectionism, not integrating minorities into the union, etc. And when the communists joined in with the CAO, it was those organizations that propelled them um, that were later used in the 50s during the Eisenhower period to purge the communists later on. I say this because that is the legacy of the Popular Front in America. The legacy of the Popular Front in Europe is different because it was about an anti-fascist coalition and it was justifying um, switching from a neutral stance in regards to the fascist versus the capitalist to siding with the capitalist world. All this is to say that the popular front had different effects in different parts of the world, but in, in no place did it lead to the communist being dominant after uh, after World War II by political means. They did not come to power in any Western democracy through the Popular Front. And as I said, in America, the Popular Front put them, actually made them vulnerable for purges in the 50s. Now, what am I telling you about the strategy? And what does this have to do with parasocial relationships, Derek? Well, what I'm criticizing people for with Sam Cedar is we can criticize the Democrats as much as you want, but if you're going to always vote for them no matter what, because that's how you feel like you affect policy, well, you'd have to have proof that you've actually affected policy that way, and you don't. And it's for game theoretical reasons. All right. The left has no alternative structures for which it can go, no great powers to which to really scare the capitalists like they did in the New Deal. There's no there's nothing really preparing propelling anybody to take these factions seriously. And instead, what you have is them being disciplined by the center of the party until they more or less co-align with it. Sam Cedar, as I said in the in the thing, comes of a generation that saw all these 
far left movement, saw the new left degenerate, saw the fall of the Soviet Union, saw a lot of things that looked like populist, maybe even left movements become very reactionary in 1978 to 1982, see the Iranian Revolution, etc. They, they were children when that happened, are young adults, but it's in the back of their mind. Jimmy Dore is around the same age and has a similar cynicism. You will note that for all his proponents, he's very limited on the kind of populism that he's proposing. The difference between Cedar and Dore is what I said earlier. Cedar has a broader worldview and will critique a lot of things, but ultimately he's going to try to defend the Democrats because he thinks that's the only lever anyone has. But what I'm saying is, if that's what you think, you actually don't have a lever. So that's the first argument. Now, I'm going to do a whole video explaining what the United Front was, the different theories around it, why it's hard to pull off in America, because there are reasons um, having to do with the fact that the U.S. is not a parliamentary democracy. But let's go back to the parasociality part. Parasocial attachments to particular media figures often substitute for political engagement. Even with someone like me. And that's not just true in streamer land. It's not, it's always been true. It's true in media. It's true for um, if you have a favorite socialist publication. It's true for sectarian organizations as well, which was the dominant form before the rise of the DSA of the left from the 1950s up through the middle of the aughts. Sectarian organizations are, right, are about having the right party line often mo removed from any mass political context. Now, I'm also going to go into this more later going into how Draper's anatomy of a microsect and, and other things, the reason why we talk about this. But what it means is projecting upon a group of a, a small group of people can seem large to an individual because, you know, anything above 250 people seems large to an individual. But in the scale of a nation, our mass politics is actually quite small, maybe in a country of a few million, let's say five to 10,000 at most. It maintains the purity of a line and usually has a very static leadership, often from, frankly, the new left. The reason why this is an issue is it is a sign that there is no mass politics, no living politics to develop a program from, for people to unite around and to strategically act accordingly. What it implies is all you have is usually a historical relationship to some key figure based primarily off text and around text. And these organizations often operate by keeping people in them busy, so they need students, or by keeping people in them having to adopt lines that seem counterintuitive, such as insisting on very particular interpretations of science or of uh, geopolitical history that might seem odd and have no effect on current politics, but are required for consistency of thought. It's a way to actually kind of shun people who would not be ready to give up that much of themselves by asking them to believe something strange first. And people don't do this consciously, by the way. A lot of guru, yes, there are guru figures and cult figures who do this deliberately, but most of this happens by accident. It's kind of an effective social structure. So what has happened with sex has moved to parasocial individuals because there aren't mass political groups for people to join outside of the DSA. What we have seen as the DSA has become more connected to the Democrats in the popular imagination, and while there may be plenty of critiques of the Democrats, in fact, plenty of verbally radical politics, the actual voting records of what they do does not really deviate that much from the standard progressive caucus line other than framing. 
And the Progressive Caucus line is not socialist and should never have been seen to be socialist. Your attachment to one of these figures is usually a detriment to your politics. All right? It substitutes a personal loyalty, but it's a personal loyalty that is not reciprocated. The thing about a parasocial relationship is not that it's mediated through electronic media. There's all kinds of relationships mediated through media, okay? It's that it's one way, and it's necessarily one way because of the scale of the attachment. There is no way for an individual to be attached to to thousands of people in their audience, but there is a way for an individual in an audience of thousands to be attached to one person. So it's called the personality stuff, but it's not deliberate, but it is a way to build a brand. Now, the credit I will give Sam Cedar is, is Cedar's show was always diverse, was always contentious, and is based primarily in progressive policy analysis with some leftist policy analysis thrown in. And he has launched the careers of many, many people who disagree with his politics. That is something you should give him credit for. He is also a key figure in the development of a progressive response to the centrist Democrats and has been since the mid-aughts, if not earlier. that doesn't change my critique of the strategic thing that ends up happening. A lot of the people who are opposed to the Democrats, you go, they're always wrong. I'm, I'm actually uh, going to tell you that, unfortunately, during the great AOC wars, um, even people who defended AOC, like my friend Ben Burgess, have, have had to say that she's regressed. Well, a lot of the stuff she regressed on was stuff that people like Dor called her out on. Now, if you think Dor is is leading people astray and into bad politics, and there's parts of his politics that I absolutely do think that, by the way, then you need to ask yourself why is why is his critique seeming to stick? Does it matter about who says it or what is said? And a lot of people, including myself at times, get too caught up in who says it. Now, who says it is not an unimportant heuristic. And who they platform and how they do it and why they do it is not an unimportant heuristic. But ultimately, your goal for adjudicating a fact is whether or not you can find its facticity. Parasocial relationships are used by most people as a way to get ethos... Uh, um, ethos in the classical rhetoric, rhetorical sense, credibility as a proxy for trust and thus a verifying gatekeeper for information, but you still cannot just trust the gatekeepers, particularly when the gatekeepers have an agenda. A lot of people then also wildly project stories and evidence and government involvement and this, that, and the other without a lot of evidence onto people to, manu to make the drama of their parasocial attachment stronger. And if somebody encourages that from you, they are generally, unless there's hard evidence, abusing you. That is a cult tactic. Now, let me get into the last thing that I want to talk about tonight, which is guru speak. Guru speak is a way of speaking that opens questions up, but the questions are generic and allows for projection. It is a way of abusing um, both parasociality and abstraction. All right. It opens people up to suggestion, but it also gives someone plausible deniability. So when you question what is suggested or say what seems to be the common interpretation, you can be called a smearer because that's not explicitly what was said. Now, unfortunately, this kind of defensiveness is also common in left um, presentations because left wingers tend to come out of academia and academia is a is a discourse generating machine that is combative, but also has limitations and has both 
truth criterion, but also, frankly, political criterion and class criterion and social capital criterion that you kind of have to deal with strategically. And so you tend to also be cagey in the way you speak. So these two discourse patterns actually interact with each other quite well because you're already getting used to leftists being unable to make clear, clean, declarative statements without caveat or jargon or some neologism, some new word, some new category that makes the critique a little harder to make. This is called statement of limitations and classical papers is actually something that's fine to do, but it's a terrible political strategy. So these two trends, this academified brain trend, and then there's need to attach the people because we don't have political power. We don't have ways to affect things, not on a national scale. And because we think the national scale is the only scale in which you can affect things because of the failures of horizontalism and localism and a lot of other stuff, you end up being kind of in a cul-de-sac where your media choices seem to matter as an expression of your politics and your identity, but don't actually change policy, even when the framing is pragmatic or about IOC or whatever, because the risk and fear built into these, um, built into these dialogues and narratives is, you know, you cannot risk empowering the Republicans by getting rid of bad Democrats, even though ultimately it's actually going to empower Republicans when you have a bunch of crappy Democrats who aren't capable of doing anything running the country. And in fact, what you're likely to get is worse. So these three things kind of come straight into each other. This kind of default popular front ism where we all defend the Democrats. Even if we critique them, our critiques don't translate into refusing to vote um, or withholding votes are, are actually punishing not just right-wing Democrats, but even centrist Democrats for supporting them because there, and because there's no place for us to strategically go, we can't really in mass threaten them as a way to do horse training in politics. So you have to come up with a different, a different way. And I pointed out right wingers actually do this to their own party and they do it effectively. And yet they still can unify left wingers and liberals tend to not be able to unify, but they are also not willing to do this to their party. That's my critique of the Sam Cedars of the world. Not because Sam personally is bad or you shouldn't listen to him. His show is fine. It's good. All right. Um, People have also noted that I have strong critiques of Bhaskar Sankar and the kind of circular reason I see come out of him. But I'm also going to say, I actually think Bhaskar is one of the best socialist strategists that we've had. Look at how his strategy when connection to Bernie led to the revitalization of the DSA, which was one of the most moribund sects in the American political scene that has a DNA and constitution that's actually really problematic because it's, you know, kind of from the Harrington period, we can go, I've gone into that before, no need to go into it here, but he built that up. He built it up off of the ideas of people like Mike McNair, but also on progressive strategy ideas, on the ideas of Austrian Marxism, but also on uh, concessions to progressives and meeting people where they're actually at. All that said, though, the DSA's national political ambitions have increasingly made it look like it is tied to the Democratic Party. So when the Democratic Party gets punished electorally for their ineffectiveness for this last round and really going all the way back to the Obama period, they will be electorally punished for this, by the way. That's almost inevitable. And the frustration is bipartisan or beyond partisanism, right? And it's definitely beyond left sectarianism you're going to be seen holding the water for a bunch of losers. That's the problem with that strategy. And if you parasocially attach the people to defend this, you miss the point. You defend your projection of your political identity and who you politically feel safe around, not what you should be doing. And then you, if you, we always talk about grifters, but there is a way in which people naturally gear up to stuff like guru speak 
uh, oppositional disorder, uh, oppositional po um, political political alignment, not disorders. That's a different thing. Um, uh, all these things really become a problem. They become a real problem. All right, because people start getting into novel takes on history, trying to revitalize uh, very weird readings that, that actually go against the plain reading of text, insisting on them. And that novelty attracting people because it seems to differentiate them from the people that they're frustrated with who are downstream from people that they're more really angry at. And in our case, the Democratic Party or Corbyn's labor, etc. You have to deal with this if you want a successful politics. If you just want to have a political projection that you enjoy and this is all entertainment for you. I would say go into a fandom and actually, you know, I think fandoms are toxic, but if you're going to have a fandom, better a fandom that doesn't pretend to be politically valid. Um, then to pretend that you're doing politics in any meaningful sense or, or rank and file organizing or any of that. It's easy to beat up on the Democrats, but on the end of the day, are you going to be willing to punish individual Democrats? Because I guarantee you, your right-wing opponents and your neoliberal opponents and the centrist opponents that you have will. And if you won't, you're at a strategic disadvantage. If you get sucked in the guru speak out of that frustration, you're likely to waste massive parts of your life, your mental resources. Um, you can be really misled. You can be radicalized towards right-wing politics without realizing it. There's all kinds of ways in which this can function that are problematic in the worst sense. But here's the other issue. None of this is the most important thing that I'm talking about. The guru speak is about you keeping your mind safe. Anti-sectarianism is about you being able to develop a line and not hold a line that just doesn't work because if it worked, that sect would be larger than it is inevitably. The issue is that a lot of these things distract from the larger points because the larger points make you feel like you have nothing you can do. But you do have things you can do. They're just at the local level. But I'm not encouraging localism. Not as like we're going to – this is what happened in the 70s. We're going to retreat from the localities. Maybe I like to think about it in terms of a term I actually pulled from the anarchist movement, but it's actually helpful here, as translocalism operating locally but coordinatedly because local politics is something you can do and you can build up grassroots and rank and file organizing and do it and then build up the capacity to change national level politics. It just takes a lot of work and a lot of coordination. What most of the socialist movement has tried to do is to change it from above first without actually having any significant representation above for a figure like Bernie to actually tie into. The squad would not have been able to get Bernie's agenda through. The current Democratic Party, and that's a reality. So ask yourself, really think about what that would take. You're not going to do it through conventional politics alone, nor can you take, I believe, a totally abstentionist line on voting because, frankly, that actually hasn't worked either. Nor are you going to have an insurrection led by 5,000 people at the most against a nuclear-armed, highly developed state. So don't even pretend on that. This is what you have to think about. Not your projections of grandeur, not your projections of the pragmatism. Because one of the things I keep saying is the pragmatism you guys have been sold isn't actually pragmatic. It comes out of hopelessness. It comes out of the treason of declining, of, of just accepting a limited range of action until that limited range is actually portrayed as somehow more liberatory or successful or strategically valid than it is. And people can really develop things out of that. Some people do it by accident. Some people do it by sincere conviction. And some people are grifters. 
most people aren't actually the accusation of being a grifter or a stooge is it it's it it actually shows that you don't understand the problems of the incentives of a media market but anyway this is something for you to think about about why i'm baffled by this whole debate around jimmy Dore and sam cedar because th my point was not that one was good and one was bad although if anything i do tend to be uh, I do tend to think that Sam Cedar has done more f good stuff in this debate, but that if you were going to make predictions off of what people were going to do and how that was going to play out, that on the Democratic Party specifically, despite all of Sam's critiques, the door was a little bit more accurate on what was going to happen. Now, on everything else, I don't think that's true. It also leads to what I like to call the Whitaker Chambers problem, but I'm going to do a whole video on that probably another time. I have some other videos coming up in this solo series. Um, we're going to do a video on on, on Kluge um, and the concept of Kluge's relationship to the Pat dependency on nailing it down. We're going to do a video on political malaise um, uh, here on Von Von Solo. And we're going to do, I'm not sure if I'm going to label this uh, nailing it down or barn vlog solo, um, but we're going to do a history on the definitions and histories and the tactics around the United Front and how it got kind of forgotten, how it got relegated to the history of Trotskyism, which is not even correct. All right. And with that, I'm going to let you have a good night. Um, don't fall for guru speak. Don't let low quality pundits take advantage of you and don't even let high quality pundits have you be loyal to things that aren't in your best interest by accident. Like and subscribe. Um, follow me around. There's been a lot of production here lately. That's going to slow down. Um, I have to go back to my day job. I have some summer vacation. I have recorded a lot of videos for the future already. Uh, that's what I do during the summer is take the time I would have done basically working and either write on my poetry or the book on Christopher Lash that I'm writing or make videos for you guys. And then I have a life later. Um, it gives me a time, though, to focus on my day job when I start it back in August. Um, but I do have a bunch of stuff still coming out. And I'm going to make these short videos for you. Um, have a great day and uh, hit the bell if you want to follow more. Do all the things that I'm really bad at doing because I don't care about marketing. Good night, comrades, and good luck.